The film you're about to see was taken between September 1969 and August 1970 at a place called Plagering A251 on the Cambodian border. It was a Special Forces A team where I served during the year I was in Vietnam. It was 40 kilometers straight west of Pleiku and 10 kilometers straight east of the line dividing Cambodia and Vietnam. The film was taken by me thinking that maybe it would be the last thing my parents would ever have to remember me by. The scenes are sort of amateurish and shot a little too fast at times, but it opens up with us being rocketed uh, by the other side and we're returning fire here and uh, what you see is taking place outside uh, the camp and we would return fire with uh, that's an 81 millimeter mortar and we would alternate uh, rounds of hotel echo or high explosive with Willie Pete or Willie F white phosphorus that's a hotel echo round that's a Willie Pete round and it was pretty loud. I remember standing behind it and getting these films uh, about blew my eardrums out. And you'll see the rounds impacting out in the distance. And uh, that would be a white phosphorus round impacting out there. And we got rocketed quite frequently. And you never knew exactly where it was coming from. So we would just try to blanket the area as well as we could um, with our mortars and the single howitzer that we had in camp. And after a while it kind of got pretty smoky out there and that is the 105 howitzer that we had with the Mountain Yard gun crew working it. And you'll see some more rounds going off here um, in the Life in camp was exposed to this from time to time. It was just part of being out there. And this is our water tower, which took a direct hit. And the camera zooms in, and you can see the water pouring out of it. And the timber is all shattered. And it was a pretty small place, and once they got the range, uh, it was kind of sticky. This was uh, an enemy uh, weapon that uh, was taken off of somebody. And these were the cooks in camp that were caught reading our charts. And they were sent to uh, play coup as prisoners. And this was an attack at night outside the wires. And you'll see some rounds, uh, some uh, small weapons fire here with tracers. I think every fifth round had a tracer in it. And... Uh, I remember this particular episode. It, it was an attack in a refugee camp outside the village. And this is our return fire. And uh, we wound up uh, in this night engagement. It went on for some time, I remember. And that's the moment of death for one of the enemy soldiers. I remember that. And this was his weapon, which we found the next day alongside of him. And... That was uh, an AK-47, I believe, a receiver group. Uh, this was the scene the next day down in the refugee village. Uh, the, the other side kind of ruled it by night, and we kind of had it by day. And they had gotten in there that night and executed some people and burned uh, houses down to the ground where people may have been cooperating with us. This refugee camp contained, I would estimate, a couple thousand people removed from the hinterlands and, and brought here to keep them away from uh, the, the um, enemy and the enemy like I say would go in there during the night and take over and we would sort of take over during the day and these are burning timbers from uh, some of the hooches still burning the next day and uh, these are mountain yard tribesmen uh, in the refugee village this is a helicopter that got sort of modified like uh, some of them did when they came in to our camp. There's some bullet holes. Uh, they would go through the chopper one side and this coming right next to this guy's boot, it came through the floor and then probably went out the roof and that was the way it was. Um, very light skinned airplane so there wasn't anything to stop them. The rounds would just go in one side and out the other. That was the Huey Slick, the standard workhorse of the war. <laughs> And uh, this is just some more uh, 
returning fire uh, on our side uh, into the hinterland outside the uh, camp. And this is a panoramic view around the camp, and that's um, looking out towards Cambodia. And that's the road back to Pleiku. It was 40 kilometers long back to Pleiku as a crow flies. The road was longer. That's looking up to the northwest by Laos, the tri-border area, and again looking out towards Cambodia now. Very remote place. Uh, we had 12 Americans there and uh, maybe 300 Mountain Yard tribesmen who were armed, and there were maybe 700 dependents. Sometimes there would only be five Americans there, and there was nothing between you and Play Coot. Not a single American, not a single South Vietnamese. It was all free fire zone. So it was pretty lonely. This was a direct rocket hit inside the inner perimeter into one of the uh, hooches of where American was, and he happened to be at the time in the team house eating, or he would have been certainly killed by this. And we had sandbags over the roof, but it was there more for psychological protection than anything else. It didn't stop anything. This was a... Um, Caribou, a twin radial engine airplane, uh, the smallest one that uh, the military had, and they would come in um, frequently to resupply us with uh, diesel fuel and some of the heavier loads that came in that wouldn't come in on a chopper. And when uh, a fixed wing airplane would come out like that under the runway and land, uh, normally speaking, up above there would be a smaller airplane of uh, somebody uh, that was armed that would uh, guard the runway and keep the other team off the off the big transport plane while it was down on the ground uh, I should say that I was somewhat fascinated by aviation over there because I just got my pilot's license just before I went to Vietnam. This is uh, the Chinook, the twin rotor blade uh, transport uh, helicopter built by Boeing Vertol. It was uh, what was used to carry some of the bulkier loads or higher number of troops. And there you see one hovering down by the chopper pad. This is uh, Caribou again. And the forward air controller above and behind him uh, uh, is patrolling over the air site, trying to uh, make sure that nobody decides to uh, rocket the runway or take that uh, airplane out once it lands there. That was the O2. Engine in back and engine in front of the airplane in single line configuration. You can see the tail boom there. Uh, this was uh, a rocket round impact right outside the dispensary, and uh, I remember ducking <laughs> a short distance before that when it landed. That was the dispensary roof, and this is uh, a chopper coming in on a medevac, and he's coming into the uh, chopper pad. It's uh, a Huey Slick, and we're going to get somebody out of here now, and you watch the power of the rotor blades as he lands on the chopper pad. And when he lands, it just, the dust cloud he would roll up was just horrendous. And you'll see um, the person being loaded on board and the chopper uh, leaving quickly. Back to play coup to the 71st evac hospital. And look at the rotor wash of the uh, the smoke bomb there. He doesn't stay long, and you'll notice that as he leaves the chopper pad, he actually loses altitude. And this was typical over in Vietnam. You like the chopper pad up high so that the a uh, chopper could actually gain speed as it as it as it dropped down through the air, so it would have a good velocity once it got out over the wires and moving fast to be uh, a target a shorter time. This was the uh, Loach, the light observation chopper, and the uh, pilot in this aircraft is. Uh, 
It's a, is the guy who goes around and his job is sort of to draw fire and as you can see there's not a lot protecting him from somebody trying to get at him however this aircraft did not work alone it always worked in tandem in something called a hunter killer team that's another forward air controller by the way uh, but you'll see in a minute what the light observation chopper has above and behind it That was our runway. It was 3,000 feet long. It was a steel tarmac. This was the Ranger. This was the chopper we didn't like seeing because it was usually high military brass, but uh, they'd come out and inspect us. But we always hoped that maybe they'd get shot at and not come out too often, which uh, did actually happen from time to time, unfortunately. So we got left alone by the higher higher out there pretty much. This is a view from outside the wires of uh, a scene where the um, O2 I mentioned previously, the guy uh, crashed out here. I remember having come out here and police up his body. And the wreckage was strewn in a path no more than 30 feet long. And it was, uh, he had two weeks left to go in country when he died. And you can see the force he impacted with. There is a ranger. And that was the Sky Crane. That was the most powerful chopper in the war, and it had um, various attachments under it. Uh, it's sort of sitting there right now without an attachment under it, and that incident cost eight lives when that Chinook went, uh, rotated into the dirt and landed on top of a troop-loaded truck and killed eight people altogether. Um, this is the scene viewing the mountains off in the direction of Laos. It was wild country, tigers and elephants and big snakes out there. Um, and this is the Huey Cobra that worked with the light observation chopper. And that has a Gatling gun on one side of it spewing a, a, a 3,000 rounds a minute and a uh, grenade launcher on the other side. Everything below and in front of this basically died. You didn't want to mess with the guy in the light observation chopper if this guy was directly behind you. And that's where you tried to take it out if you were shooting at it in the transmission. And there were two people on board this affair, uh, a pilot and a gunner. And when it started to shoot, the, uh, the tracers, even though it was every fifth round, would be a solid sheet of red going from the aircraft into the ground at night. It was just incredible. It was a very narrow airframe. It's only three feet wide. I wouldn't want that coming at me, uh, spewing uh, ammunition at me. I don't. It would be very difficult to take out. I remember that as the most awesome close ground support uh, system that they had over there. If you were in need of somebody helping you from above, you hoped and prayed that something like that would arrive on the scene. It even looks sinister to watch it. And as I say, there's the Cobra in front and the Loach in back. This is a scene of a, a medevac now, and I'm on board, and this is out uh, going out towards Cambodia. And you'll actually see the river separating Cambodia from South Vietnam. There it is in the background. Um, we're going to pick somebody up out here. And this was always kind of a scary time for me. I hated the insertions and the extractions. You just hung on the tip of the rotor blade. There's the river uh, separating Vietnam from Cambodia. And we were very close to the line. Um, and when we come in there, I think that may have been, uh, if that was, a, yeah, it was somebody else's signal. That may have been the other team trying to get us to land over by them. I don't remember. This gets kind of com discombobulated here. We landed, we didn't stay very long, and there's the river. And we landed uh, in this clearing and picked this guy up. and. I just remember waiting and waiting and waiting for the guy to spill, build up speed on the collective and get out of there uh, before uh, any shooting started. And that's the way insertions and extractions were over there. You never I always felt more comfortable down in the weeds crawling around than I did going in in a chopper and getting out uh, of it uh, after standing or hovering above the triple canopy 75 feet off the ground, a sitting duck for anybody in the tree line. And there we are getting out of there. 
And you'll see the flight back to play Durang now. And there's Plagiarang, and the reason it's all brown is I'm sure it was covered with Agent Orange uh, and Malathion. These were two big 175s from the 4th Infantry. They were stationed there for about a month, huge guns, and they would fire, I think I was told it was $800 a round, and they would fire uh, at nothing. Just It's called harassment and interdiction fire at $800 a pop. There's a round going off impacting. And while they were there, it was a little quieter, but then they left, and we were left with our single 105 pop gun, and here it is, and we're under attack again. And it was quiet when the big guns were there, but they were only there a month, and then they were gone, and then we are back on our own again. And the 105 crew was, they were okay, uh, I guess, but when we were out on patrol, we were usually out of their range, and uh, they weren't trained uh, in the American artillery. Sometimes you just, uh, I guess you just, gave them your coordinates, and uh, the rounds would maybe land haphazardly around you. You didn't worry about it. Um, and this is just more artillery fire outside of uh, the encampment into wherever we were thought we were getting hit from. It was always difficult to figure out where you were getting hit from. It was very difficult. This is uh, more shooting at night, obviously. These scenes were the most difficult for me to get in the entire film. I took the camera out on patrol for two weeks once, and it was very difficult because you're carrying your gun, you're carrying your ammo, you're carrying your food. We did not, once we got inserted, get resupplied because we were tiny in size and didn't want to give our position away. So you carried everything on your back. I got treated pretty good out there. I used to run the patrols with one other American. There were two of us out there and 15 people, only one of whom spoke pidgin English. And basically they took pretty good care of you. They knew that any error or artillery support had to come through you, and so th you were like the great white hunter out there, basically. They dug a hole for you at night and um, built a hooch cover over you or whatever. And I remember that when I was out on patrol, what I remember most about it is at the end of two weeks, you couldn't stand the smell of yourself, and you didn't have any trouble keeping five feet away, which was called uh, uh, separation discipline. You didn't want to all step into one spot and get blown away, so you, you didn't have any trouble keeping away from people because everybody stank so bad after two weeks without a bath. And during the dry monsoon, basically, if you wanted to find Charlie, you'd usually find him somewhere near the water. <laughs> We were all looking for water. Um, and we ate rice. That's me. I was 27 years old. And we tried to look like the mountain yards. The trouble was we were a little taller than them, but we tried to look like them. You didn't want to look like an American. You didn't want to look like any different than the other people if you could avoid it uh, and be a target that somebody else would be trying to aim in on. I'm setting up the Prick 25 radio here for a call-in for the night position. We'd always try to tell them where we were at night. Sometimes it was pretty difficult to know where you were, um, but you needed to know where you were. Uh, if you didn't know where you were, you couldn't get help from the outside, and that might uh, cost you dearly. I never had to carry the radio. It was always one of the Montagnard tribesmen who carried it. And there I am trying to figure out where we are, and I'm back triangulating using the compass. And you wanted to know where you were, like I say. Um, sometimes the train blended in pretty good, and you could just barely make out a hill, and I'm back triangulating there. You're always worried that if you didn't know where you were, that's when you get hit, and then, then you would be on your own. And we were such a tiny unit out there that... Uh, I'm convinced that if we ever run into anything sizable, I wouldn't be here. It was that lightly armed, and it was that close to the edge in terms of us being able to take care of ourselves. Life uh, with the 15 mountain yards that we're with, we called them yards, was uh, sometimes uh, amusing. They were, they were good soldiers, basically, 
and I think the reason I'm alive is because we were with the Montagnards. They befriended the French when they came, and they befriended the Americans when they came, and they were natural enemies of the Vietnamese and vice versa. Matter of fact, as recently as 100 years ago, the Vietnamese used to hunt Montagnards for sport. So there was no love lost between these hill people and the people down in the lowlands, but they always seemed to um, favor an invader, which we were. These people we came across on patrol, we had no choice, we had to, we had to take them back to play Durang. We, we sent them out with a couple people detached from the patrol and took them back at gunpoint where they would give away our position. This was an NVA canteen that we found out there. And this was the, a bunker site that we were getting rocketed from. And we found it and decided that we wanted to booby trap it and wait in hopes that they would come to use it again. And there's a swath that they cut through the trees and guess what comes up in the background through the telephoto lens? There it is, Plage Ring, sitting on top of the hill. And they had rocketed us from the site, and that's a spent casing on a Chinese communist uh, rocket round. That was a bunker. So we set up a booby trap, and again, a spent casing on a rocket round that I'm holding there. It was nerve-wracking, and I uh, used to smoke cigars out there, the only time I ever smoked anything in my life. And there's a Claymore mine. It comes into view here that we set up, and there it is right there. It's difficult to see in the weeds, but then uh, leading back to it, we had a trip. Uh, we had a wired electrical contact, and the guy sat there awake all night holding it in his hand. There it is, and he would have set it off if somebody had come down that trail, but nobody did. It was to no avail. They didn't use the site that night. We booby-trapped it when we left, and that was it. And there I am eating whatever I had to eat. Um, you tried to eat what they ate, and they didn't have any trouble smelling like they smelled. They ate dried minnows, and I remember that's me eating dried minnows and rice, and dried minnows were not... I, I think I had enough dried minnows at the end of the year that I didn't want to ever eat any more dried minnows. I carried a um, Car 15. It was a sawed-off M16. You cleaned it every day like your life depended on it. You used to take it apart every single day and put the uh, rod down it and clean it. And this is a, a helicopter flying overhead. I'm not sure what was going on here. This snixing is staged. I never filmed anything while we were moving. It was just too dicey. But this is a guy carrying a Prick 25 radio behind me, and I'm just walking along there. And uh, you weren't smoking a cigar underway either because you were making smoke, and somebody might see that. But I uh, was actually talking to that chopper now, and I recall it. And uh, this is just a moment of what it might have looked like minus the cigar when we're actually moving and you can see how dense the brush is uh, incredible to move through and this is a, a, a cache of rice that we found that the enemy had and we dumped it on the ground and spread it around make sure they couldn't take make any use of it and basically out here it was sort of a shoot first ask questions later there wasn't anybody supposed to be out here and so you didn't need to worry about um, coming across somebody and harming them since they weren't supposed to be out there theoretically. That didn't prove to be the case always, as you'll see momentarily. Right here is a village that we came across filled with people that we actually walked into under orders from uh, play coup. If you look closely at this village and the people in it, they're all innocent civilians. You'll notice an absence of young men. They've all been taken away by the other side. But I want you to note how clean the ground is and how clean the village is. And note how healthy looking the people look. So these people were, were forced against their will to leave here and go to the refugee village at our behest. And they had no choice. And there was just a look of resignation that morning, I remember it. Uh, no one could protest, no one could do anything. There were pawns in a violent war and uh, powerless to do anything about it. Their young men had been taken away by the other side and we took them away uh, since they were a support system for the enemy. And I remember the village, I remember how nice it looked and how these people were getting along just fine here. And 
I remember some resentment on their faces when we uh, ordered them to pick everything up that they had in the world and take it what they could with them on their back. And after we uh, tried to put uh, the soothing lotion on things a little bit by uh, taking care of some of their minor medical problems, we had them line up and move out, and it didn't in any way make up for uh, what we were doing as far as I was concerned, and there I am working on somebody. But uh, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't possibly in your mind, in, in any sense, uh, think that this would make up for being uh, forced, as you can see them here, to gather up and leave the village. And I remember once we were out, outside of the village and on the trail and heading back to play Durang, I could hear the 105 howitzer destroying the place. And when you see the refugee village later on in this film and see the marked contrast between that place and this place, you'll have a pretty good idea of why we lost, in part anyway, the war. This is uh, the American that I was out on patrol with after the patrol. Uh, there are some uh, villagers coming uh, into the refugee village. That's plage ring in the distance on the hill. And this is being shot from the direction of the refugee village, I believe. This is now down in the refugee village where I used to go twice a week. I used to go there and it's it I would go there alone, the only American with uh, some mountain yard troopers who were armed and we would wade into death and disease and do what we could. And this is a man with polio. I saw a lot of that down there. It was a desperate place, uh, filthy beyond belief. Um, a whole section of it was given off to lepers who were condemned to live in their section of the village by the rest of the people who didn't have leprosy. I always worried that someone would jump around the corner and drill me. I think uh, it's testimonial to what happens when you're a medic in a war. I'm sure I helped a lot of communists down there that year. It didn't matter if you were sick and ill or, or injured. I went down there and did what I could to help you, and I didn't ask which side you're on, and I'm sure that had something to do with why I'm still alive. Um, since it was my memory <laughs> that um, the refugee village was seldom visited by any of the other people on the A-team, the Americans. It was just mostly the medics who went down there, and we had to go down there alone. And, and it was literally uh, another mile outside the wires of Play Durain, closer to the border. And you just, you just were resigned when you did it. You just went down there and played the role of the humanitarian, and uh, no one ever harmed me doing it. The poverty there was just, it was incredible. Uh, if you look at the bellies of a lot of the little children, you'll see them swollen. That's quash yorker, protein deficiency. People died here. They died here in droves. They died literally daily of malaria, uh, starvation, and, and what have you. We would bring uh, food to the village uh, when we could get it, but these people were basically caged here, taken from the sea, as you will, in the theory that we would keep them away from the gorillas, as it were. Um, my memory of it is the strategy did not work real well. Uh, some of the animals that they had down there, some chickens. They had a different brand of pig than I've ever seen. I saw very few cows and very few goats, and by far the most common source of food was dogs. More than any other animal, the mountain yards ate dogs. It was hard to witness. They would put them in a bag and throw rocks on them until the do dogs started screaming and died, and then they would eat it. When they set their huts up, they would dig a deep hole in the ground for the posts, and they would have several of them. And then, because of the wet monsoons, the houses were up off the ground.
you had to try to be part of them and, and get their confidence, and that meant drinking their rice wine, which, which I did. And you can see some people that are four sheets of the wind here. And they're having a party, and they insisted that I party with them. So when you're in the Special Forces, you were instructed to be uh, as much like the indigenous people as you could. And I remember I didn't particularly like the rice wine. It had a lot of seeds in it, and, it, and uh, these are very primitive people. But uh, they did get me to sit down, and, uh, and there I am. I'm having some wine, and you take a sip of it, and you'd have to spit the seeds and the dirt out. But they liked rice wine, and that was their distraction. And there I'm spitting a little bit out, and uh, I've had enough now, thank you. And I'm going to move on and see if I can help. You know, I've got to go. I'm sorry. I can't stay any longer. And you saw kids smoking, very young. Now watch. She doesn't mess around. Watch her nose. This is She's going to inhale this one, yep just like a boulder. Look at the goiter on that woman's neck. Obviously thyroid deficient. Uh, huge goiter. This was something that you witnessed down there, the, uh, the winnowing of the grain. The little girls could take the grain and, and, and put it in their baskets, and they had a beautiful basketry the mountain yards did. And they would, they would be able to winnow it and I tried my hand at uh, separating the grain from the hulls, and I was okay at this, I guess, but this is something I could never do, and the little girls were expert at it. Even in no wind, they wouldn't lose a grain of rice. It would be all chaff, but I could never do any good at it. Look at the filth here on the ground, and this is what these people were condemned to live in in the refugee village, which um, was something that, that we enforced in an attempt to keep the people away from um, the other side. So you wandered down here amongst these people and did what you could to help. Frequently, the little children would have very high fevers, and since I wasn't certain what was going on, I would give them a shot of chloroquine in one hip and a shot of penicillin in the neck in the other hip, and by God, a, a whole heck of a lot of them lived uh, somehow. Either they had pneumonia or they had malaria, I didn't know which, and I'd give them a shot on each side, and the next time I'd come down, they'd be doing better. This is the leper colony. This was the most depressing part of the whole village. You'll notice this uh, woman's fingers missing. Um, this was horrible to witness, and they were shunned by the rest of the people in the village because they didn't want to catch the disease themselves. And the stench just walking by was just incredible. And you couldn't reverse it, you just dressed their wounds and the ravages of the disease as best you could. This man's missing his fingers. They didn't live too long. Once they, once they, this woman's got the beginning of it on her left foot. Once they couldn't, once they had no fingers, they would usually, I'm sure, in a, in the normal society in the course of events, wind up dying of starvation because they weren't, uh, they had no way of, of uh, gathering food. This was. Uh, the dispensary, and we're going to get in the jeep right there and drive down to the refugee refugee village. And that was the big box full of medicines that we took. And I took the mountain yard medics with me, and it was pretty important to try to train them. That's me in the foreground. And you tried to train them as well as you could, so that when you left, maybe there would be some semblance of help afterwards. And they were pretty good students. And, they, and uh, as you can see, the women, they always went around bare-breasted. They had only their loincloths, and the men had very short shorts on. And most of them were very grateful for whatever you could give them. I remember, though, that we had trouble sometimes helping the little children because the mountain, our parents would take the theory that we don't want to do anything to upset our children because when we get old we want them to take care of us. And sometimes I watch the medics get angry with uh, some of their fellow hill tribesmen for not helping with the care of the kids. This woman is blinded from trachoma and she'll be blind for the rest of her life. I treated all kinds of early trachoma and uh, there may still be some people seen as a result of that. 
it was a flyborne virus that the fly would get in the person's eye and the virus would get in their eye and the, their cornea would glaze over and, and they would go blind. Now this is a medic giving uh, one of the mountain yards uh, some medicine, some trachoma medicine. Uh, their toys were pretty rudimentary. I don't think life was that much fun for a kid in that camp. This is me making a house call. And that's literally all the bigger their houses were. It was tiny. You would go in there and do whatever you could to help somebody and come back out. And that was the house call. You could see how they had a log and they'd chop uh, steps in it to get up to the place. And that's me holding the kid, and uh, the mother's very concerned, and uh, the mountain yard is giving it a shot. The mountain yard medic is giving it a shot. Saw a lot of impetigo there, staphylococcal skin disease. Saw some pretty good cases of fungus. Now, they would catch fish and hang them out to dry. And... That didn't help the aroma of the place either. But if I had no more to eat than those people had to eat, I'm sure I would have looked at this as very welcome, thank you. And that's a case of trachoma. And this was a dispensary that we built down there. It didn't stay very long before it was blown up by the other side. But the chief engineer here was very proud of his work. I just remember not lasting long. And that's impetigo of a kid's scalp. This is some sort of religious ceremony that they had. I'm not sure what that connotated. This would be about as old as you would see somebody. And this man has polio, and that's why his leg looks like that. That was Ting. Uh, he was one of my medics. He was treating somebody for glaucoma there. And that was Sock. Sock spoke good English. He spoke Vietnamese. He was a mountain yard. He was my right-hand man the year I was in Vietnam. That's me with a little mountain yard child. Another one of the medics. And I'm listening to somebody with pneumonia there. And that's Ting. He's trying on my Green Beret. I think he liked it. His brother was killed one day out on the road with me coming back from play kill. That's Sock. Again, he was the, the key critical man the year I was there. This guy spoke good English. He spoke good Vietnamese, and I couldn't have done anything there that year without him, since I spoke neither language. And that's me playing with a child again. A mountaineer with a toy. The toys were very simple by American children's standards. These were some prisoners of war that we gathered up outside the camp, and they're going back to play coup. And this was the uh, skyhook uh, chopper that came and picked me up when I went on R&R. &R. And the next view is pretty striking contrast. We're now in Sydney, Australia a day removed from the war. 
And I remember this so well because if you were lucky, you got to Sydney, Australia. We always used to say over there, we want to get to where the round eyes are, the girls with round eyes. Well, you didn't normally get there unless you were married, and I only got there because uh, the company clerk stole my R&R, uh, &R and my father complained to the U.S. Center from the state of Michigan, and next thing I knew, I was whisked away to Australia directly on orders from the Pentagon that uh, created a little bit of furor back in play coup when I returned, but uh, I only had a month left in the Army, so it wasn't that big a deal for me anyway. Uh, and this is out, This is in Sydney Harbor, and... I spent four months with the Navy SEALs uh, in temporary duty with them uh, out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina, before going to Vietnam in an underwater demolition training. And so I was pretty proficient in scuba diving. I wanted to do a little more diving down there. And I remember the Australian guys that went out with me that day, the guides. They were very nice, and they... Uh, they were very. They seemed uh, concerned about me. I, I had that sense. They kept saying, "I, I just hope you get home okay." And uh, that was in June of 1970, and it would have been during their winter, so to speak. Needless to say, as you can see, it wasn't real cold, but uh, we still had wetsuits on. I would have loved to have seen the Barrier Reef back then, but I didn't have any money, so that was it. I stayed in Sydney. It was just an unreal world to be in a war and step into Western civilization like that one day away from a war. And all of a sudden, in a place that has Kentucky Fried Chicken, even in 1970, and, uh, and normal sane life. It was unbelievable. The contrast was just not to be believed. You had one week in Sydney uh, that you you were off the devil's shovel. And here we are back in, in Sydney, and uh, we're about to see the real reason I want to go to Sydney, except first we need to go to the Australian War Memorial. I remember this. This was touching. It was a... Uh, a nude soldier draped on a sword, and all the great battles that uh, that Australia has been in uh, over the years are there. And there's the soldier, and it was just touching to see it. But this is what I really wanted to see, of course, was girls, 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 and there were plenty of them, and they all were wearing minis, and it was just awesome. And while I was there, I saw plenty of sailors, and I was very envious of them because they would be on these big ships, and they would be based out of Australia, and they didn't need to worry about getting shot at or anything like that. It was just, I was very envious of them. And you had your hippie crowd uh, there, too, and there they are. And the double-decker bus is reminiscent of Britain. And this is my favorite set of legs in all of Sydney, Australia. I remember this. And that's the contrast, folks. And a day later, you're right back in the war on a Cambodian border down in the refugee village. And nothing in between. And it was an incredible culture shock. I would say that um, the only parallel like with that was probably coming home equally. So one of my medics is giving one of the mountaineers a shot in the hip. Uh, that looks like uh, bicelin, which is a form of penicillin. And you can see the impetigo on this woman's neck. I saw more disease here in one year than I've seen in 25 back in this country easily. That may have been a grandmother with her grandchild. You would think so from looking at the contrast in the ages. Look at the fungus growing on this woman's arm.
That's the dispenser again while it was still standing. And here they are uh, working on it, building the walls, splitting the reeds for it. That adds, you saw everybody had an ads that was a mountain yard tribesman. And they, like I said, they were beautiful weavers of baskets and, and their whole building structure was made out of material like this. Extremely simple uh, group of people living off the land, much like they had a thousand years ago. But in this setting, living in desperate poverty like they wouldn't normally be living in, I'm convinced. And here's an abscess on somebody's buttock, and uh, we're putting some medicine on it. And when he gets up to walk away, you'll see why he has an abscess there, because he can't walk away. He has polio, and that's how he moves around. Another one with a huge goiter on her neck. I don't believe in more modern times when I've watched uh, footage of third world countries in poverty and desperation that I've ever seen anything as desperate as I saw in this refugee village, day in, day out. I remember one time medicating a baby and I must have overdosed it. It died shortly thereafter. And the next time I came down in the village, I'd heard about it, and I was worried that I wouldn't be received. But people received me right away, again, willingly. Uh, it was obvious that what we were doing there was helping, for the most part, in large measure. I think this was a prostitute. I'm not certain. She had a big cigar, I remember that, and she wanted me to smoke it, so I smoked it with her. Uh, this is seen as back around camp now. This is a light anti-tank weapon, shoulder-fired weapon, and used to practice with it. It was good for one shot, and he threw it away. And you'll see it go off here in a second and see what it can do. It goes into an old wrecked truck, and that's the kind of uh, impact it has. You wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that thing, obviously. Uh, I'm not sure what this is. This is taken at night, right outside the wires of play Durang. I'm not don't remember what this was about. Uh, these scenes are now taken, this is inside the outer perimeter where the mountain yard strikers, we would call them, with their families, their dependents stayed. There were about 300 of them and maybe 700 dependents. There was about a thousand mountain yard tribesmen in the outer perimeter and there were 12 Americans and some Vietnamese in the inner perimeter. The, Last girl down the hill was featured with me in the June 1970 Reader's Digest, and there she is. Our pictures were together in the June 1970 Reader's Digest when somebody came out and covered what I was doing down in the refugee camp, and the two of us appeared together in that issue. The Vietnamese looked different than the Mountaineers, and here's a couple of Vietnamese girls, beautiful girls, playing jacks. And here's some mountain yards that uh, live more like the Westerners. They, um, they were quite clean and bathed every day. And uh, that was our laundry boy. We had our needs taken care of out there by the indigenous population pretty much. And that was Sock's brother. And some of them uh, like to polish their boots and, and stay pretty uh, strack looking. And that's Sock right there with his brother in the background, I believe. That's Sock, excuse me, on the left. Again, the key man while I was there that year. I often wonder where he is now. Is he still alive? Did they do him in over his uh, siding with us during the war? I do not know. I will never know. But I will remember him for the rest of my life. A generous, good man. This is uh, something we didn't like to see, fogged in. And you always worried that they would try to overrun the place in this sort of a condition because you couldn't call in any air support. 
and we were out of the range of any artillery. And this would have been bad had we been clobbered like this. Indeed, Plagering was the first place after the truce in all of South Vietnam to be overrun in the fall of 1973. One morning, uh, Vietnamese rangers woke up and the North Vietnamese were 180 degrees around the perimeter and they just simply overran the place in block, totally. And the other side got out and ran away and suddenly they owned it. It was the very first place in all of South Vietnam to go to the other side during this supposed truce. Uh, this is uh, one of the interpreter's wives watching, watching her kid. We were very dependent on the mountain yard interpreters. They all spoke good English and they spoke good Vietnamese and of course they spoke the Rade or the Jirai uh, tongue of the local hill tribesmen as well. The interpreters had to be very intelligent people to master all of that and I always uh, thought very highly of them. They took up our lifestyle very much while I was there I noticed and dressed like us and acted like us as much as they could. This is one of them washing his boy some of them were very muscular, and you'll see why in a minute. This guy is no exception. Look at the muscles on this guy, just bristling with them, and you'll see why in a minute. Life inside the wires was far cleaner than the life down below in the refugee camp, needless to say, and it was cleaner inside the inner perimeter where the Americans and the Vietnamese and the mountain yard interpreters stayed than it was in the out, inside the outer perimeter, which of course was outside the inner perimeter. The camp consisted of an outer perimeter and an inner perimeter. And our biggest worry there was the camp being taken over by some sort of an insurrection from within, basically. We thought we could handle the other team if they were coming at us from outside the wires, but you always were concerned about inside the wires, like when we caught our cooks jotting our positions down out on patrol at night inside the uh, kitchen. Uh, these are kids playing in a box um, that we had for them on camp. That was uh, our combo men, our two combo men playing with the kids. They used to play with the kids every night. Had a lot of fun with the kids every night. Usually these are interpreters kids. Hamming it up in front of the camera. This is inside the dispensary, poorly lit, and look at the growth on this person's ear. That was my junior medic. I was, I was a senior medic by that time. When I arrived, I was the junior medic. By the time I left, I was a senior medic. Um, I think this is uh, some night scenes now, uh, Yeah, shooting the recoilless rifle mounted on, permanently on the Jeep, just practice rounds. And somebody's got a meal coming here. I don't know what animal that was. This is a Vietnamese child. You notice the lighter skin and the different facial features. This is a mountain yard latrine in the inside the outer perimeter and outside the inner perimeter. Again, those sandbags, I don't think they did much. This was uh, the NVA automatic machine gun that they used against us. We captured one of those. Two dogs, I'm sure, about to become somebody's meal before too long. It amazed me how they would play with them and then one day and then the next day eat them. And the way they killed them was incredibly cruel, throwing rocks on them inside a gunny sack. And you'd hear the dog screaming until it stopped screaming and then they would eat it. Very hard to watch. Another interpreter. Those are 175 casings, shell casings, filled with cement. And if a round hit, impacted, and started to spread horizontally across the ground, of course, you'd want to be behind one of those things. A child running on top of a rooftop of sandbags with, you can see, the concertina wire all around. The inner perimeter was designed so it could hold out uh, an attack from the outer perimeter. The outer perimeter was designed so it could hold out an attack from outside. And here's one of the interpreters pumping. Those are stone pieces that they've fashioned into something on a pipe to make themselves weights. And these guys used to work out regularly. And they weren't hurting for nutrition because they ate with us. That's an arc light out over the Cambodian line on the other side, a B-52 strike. And I remember that. And the ground trembled from 25 miles away for 60 seconds nonstop.
The force of that must have been awesome. Scenes inside the inner perimeter again, I believe. How wide was the inner perimeter? Well, it was probably 25 or 30 yards, maybe maybe 50 yards across. They used, they landed rounds, rocket rounds inside the inner perimeter of the year I was there. There was a four-deuce mortar. I remember every time it fired, it cracked the base plate. It used to make the weapon sergeant so angry because he'd have to relay the cement base plate every time it fired. We never could somehow get that act down. That was the single heaviest mortar in camp. These are the diesel uh, fuel bladders. They would be hilly lifted out there for the generators. 50 caliber machine gun, technically outlawed by the Geneva Convention. We didn't have a Geneva Convention war, though, so I guess you didn't worry about it. And that was a shoulder-held bazooka. The M60 machine gun in front and a 45 caliber machine gun in back, those are our weapons. The World War II one was in back, the Vietnam one was in front. That was the team sergeant. 60 millimeter mortar, the most numerous mortar in camp. We carried one out on patrol without the base plate. I think that was a Vietnamese prostitute. I remember there was a consternation when they were allowed to have her, and of course we didn't. We had to be on our strict behavior out there. I remember one man out there consorting with a mountaineer woman. He was immediately tossed off site, an American, for doing it. And this was the team house. That was one of the uh, Americans shooting uh, his rifle in practice. Um, on semi-auto. That's the M79 grenade launcher and there you see uh, the round of impact second in a second. It's like a hand grenade except it went out. Now this is uh, towards the end of the movie now and we're uh, in a chopper and we're running along the road back to play coup. And you didn't like to get on that road. I remember the early year I was there, anytime somebody got on it, virtually always somebody died. It was 40 kilometers back to Pleiku through no man's land, and the other side basically owned that road. This is it. And when somebody came out on it, they came out uh, loaded for bear, and you usually ran into it. And the way the chopper pilots used to like to go down it was three feet off the deck, full bore, be a difficult target, or they'd like to be about 3,000 feet out of small arms fire. If you were inspecting something, you would go, uh, in inspecting the road, you'd be going long, right down low on the deck, fast. And it was really something to fly in these things at that speed over the deck. Um, it was just reminiscent of the whole experience over there, life on the edge, and look how low we are. And we're doing, going down this road, and you will see what we find here en route back to Play Coup. Um, they've blown a bridge over the river, and we have already replaced it, I guess, with a new bridge. But there's the river, and you can see now up ahead the, the bridge is blown out by the other side, and I think off to the left it doesn't come into view, but there's another bridge in this place. And there was an M60 machine gun on each side of the Huey Slick with a door gunner on each side and two pilots and whoever was passenger. And there you are, three feet off the deck doing 120 knots. And that would be the co-pilot on the left and the pilot would sit on the right. That was the way it was configured in Vietnam. And rotor wing aircraft. And now this is coming to the end of the film. And here's Plagiarine coming up in the background, and you can see the Red Cross on the dispenser, and this is where I spent the 27th year of my life.